The heated atmosphere of the United States is getting closer to the presidential election is affecting the geopolitical systems of the world's most powerful countries. The European Union is concerned about the deepening isolationism in American society and the need to focus solely on its own internal problems. I invite you to a conversation about the political landscape of the United States facing one of the most important elections in recent years. Here to join me are Tanya Domi, school from International and Public Affairs, Columbia University, and Goran Agric, non-resident senior fellow, Atlantic Council. Good evening, ladies. Thank you so much for joining us here on TVP World tonight. Thank you for having Thank you. So in recent days, one could sense that there is a common strategy between um, the Democrats regarding the removal of President Joe Biden from the race for the re-election, re uh, something that we've seen yesterday, a very busy 24 hours. Um, what do you think, what ideas are clashing with the party at this point? Um, do you think that uh, there is a further path to the common presidency and which direction um, could potentially the next, uh, the next nominee take the party? Party in. Um, this would be the question to Tanya Domi first, please. Yes, well, it's been a remarkable 24 hours, and um, there is a, a, an apparent co coalescing uh, right now to embrace uh, Kamala Harris, the vice president of the United States. Yesterday, Joe Biden stepped down, announced he was stepping down from uh, seeking the nomination, and that he endorsed his uh, vice president uh, robustly. And in the past 24 hours, it is remarkable that the Democrats have raised $90 million. They're shooting for $1 million today. Uh, there's been a rolling endorsements from hundred more than 152 members of the House of Representatives, more than 32 senators in the U.S. Senate. Uh, six states have locked down their pledged delegates to Kamala Harris in the past 24 hours. And not only that, a, a half a dozen a, a state governors who would all be potentially seen as a challenger uh, that have presidential uh, aspirations have endorsed her. And just in the past hour and a half, Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker Emerita of the House of Representatives, has, has endorsed her. And the rest of the leadership in the House is meeting with her within the next 24 hours. And I would certainly anticipate their endorsement as well. And now, uh, Gorana Grich, a question for you in regards of the future of the uh, Democratic Party. As we're looking at the events of the last 24 hours, it is uh, clear that uh, this decision and uh, the announcement by President Joe Biden created quite a stir. Uh, would you say that this is going to create some friction within the Democratic Party? Well, if Democrats are serious about seizing the moment and winning the election in November, then hopefully not. Um, but there are, at least from my uh, point of view, three things that Democrats need to do now. Um, first of all, to uh, sort out the uh, debate that's going on about the potential of this open convention, which, again, if you think about the success uh, of any political movement, would probably be something that would be counterproductive, because if a political movement is not coherent, it's very hard to expect it to be successful. So uh, to make sure that then if uh, Kamala Harris is indeed the presumptive nominee, um, that uh, everyone rallies behind her. Uh, otherwise, the Democrats in general might be uh, in, in a lot of problems. Second of all, Democrats need to seize the agenda setting momentum. Uh, it's it seems that at least uh, ever since Donald Trump's uh, attempt of assassination, um, there has been this uh, feeling that uh, Republicans have been on the front foot and that Democrats have been unable to uh, set the agenda 
on issues that matter for this election. So uh, that kind of messaging, once the, again, consolidation of support around the candidate is there, uh, th that should uh, be something that would be uh, top of priorities. And then thirdly, uh, which is something that we've seen now uh, over the past 24 hours, uh, what Democrats absolutely also need, need to do leading uh, into the convention of August 19 is complete that ticket. So uh, the VP stakes, so who is going to be um, the, the vice president if Kamala Harris again uh, is uh, the, the uh, presumptive nominee for the Democratic uh, Party, uh, that name should be put forward uh, very soon because again, on the Republican side, uh, the ticket is complete and uh, J.D. Vance needs to have a mm -hmm. sparing partner um, again for the success of Democrats come November 5th. So we just heard uh, Ms. Grigic say that seizing the moment is one of the goals of the Democratic Party that would have to take place. Uh, Ms. Domi, uh, what, is, what do you think about that statement, especially considering that uh, the Democratic uh, Convention is taking place on the 19th of August? So there's very little time after such a massive, such a seismic shift taking place. Do you think that there is still time to seize the moment? Absolutely. I absolutely think there's time to seize the moment. And I think actually I would add to what um, what my colleague has just said, and that is the most important thing from my point of view is that the party must unify. And that is actually happening right now in real time. The campaign continues. And as a matter of fact, uh, the vice president is meeting with the campaign staff today in Wilmington, Delaware right now. And they haven't been able to talk about the agenda because they've been focused on an internal process uh, on, on the, the issues surrounding the president. And so that is essentially over. And so this new agenda setting is going to roll out over the country with the campaign and the campaign staff. And I will say this, that I believe the Democrats are more strategically positioned, more effectively positioned on the ground. They have put out 200, more than 200 offices, and this started a year ago. And they have a ground game, and it will come down to get out the vote. But the most important issue here is to unify the party. And I think you're seeing this as these endorsements roll out. And I would add there, it's very likely that one of the governors, uh, and I would say Joshua Shapiro, who's the governor of Pennsylvania, is certainly uh, a highly considered candidate to, to uh, become vice president. And also Steve, uh, uh, the governor of uh, Kentucky, uh, Mr. Bashur, who is won re-election two times in the red state of Kentucky. I think both of them are very attractive. And the third one is more than likely Mark Kelly, U.S. Senator from Arizona, who's certainly being discussed openly. Those things are going to happen. They're mm -hmm. going to take place over the next few days. And that's when you will see the agenda setting. This is definitely going to be a, an incredibly busy time for, for both sides of the equation. However, I would like to slightly switch gears right now and um, take a look at how the upcoming U.S. election could possibly uh, have an effect on our side of the pond, on the European Union. We know that at today's meeting of EU foreign ministers in Brussels, Polish, uh, Poland's foreign minister Radosław Sikorski presented an initiative in a form of a document presented to all EU members and institutions. And he was calling for positive action ahead of the U.S. election to kind of showcase um, how, how the EU is actually contributing um, to, to encourage both sides. He said, at this critical moment in history, it is imperative that we act together swiftly and decisively to strengthen the transatlantic relationship. Um, it, do you think that the EU countries are going to align uh, on this very important issue? This is a question for uh, Ms. Grzic. 
Well, this is something that uh, is yet to be seen uh, over the coming months, but I would just say that already all throughout this year, uh, we have seen um, basically ever since it was clear that Donald Trump would be the nominee for the uh, GOP ticket for presidency, that uh, countries have started adjusting their foreign policies and their strategies, uh, medium term, even long term, uh, to the fact that we might see the return of Donald Trump to the White House. Uh, but now, obviously, uh, the urgency is even greater than it might have been just a couple of months ago, and certainly uh, that urgency has risen uh, over the past month. Look, um, in terms of the uh, policy platforms, uh, when it comes to the sense towards transatlantic relations writ large, I don't think that there could be uh, two sort of options that could be starker uh, and, and in more contrast uh, as to uh, where things go uh, when it comes to US-EU relations, but also US position in NATO. And so when in 2020, uh, we saw the election of uh, Joe Biden, uh, Ursula von der Leyen and Charles Michel penned that famous letter where they were uh, enthusiastic about uh, finding again uh, a sort of cooperative uh, partner in the White House, notwithstanding issues that emerged, you know, already in 21, if you want, from uh, the withdrawal of uh, from Afghanistan or the announcement of AUKUS agreement and, and so on. Um, however, again, uh, there was a sense that EU and US could cooperate, and we saw that on a number of issues. And of course, we've seen that unity uh, still continue uh, ever since uh, Russia's uh, second uh, invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022. Uh, on the Republican side, uh, there has been uh, uh, no uh, uh, sort of equivocation as to where Donald Trump and, again, his vice presidential uh, uh, running mate uh, stand. Uh, they see European Union as essentially a rival when it comes to trade relations. They see NATO as essentially this sort of archaic, useless, uh, a platform that uh, um, could be uh, put could stand only if uh, this kind of uh, principle of transactionality is is uh, highly regarded. Right, the insistence on defense spending and, and kind of almost the, the sort of defense racket uh, that Donald Trump has been uh, promoting uh, over the course of his presidency. And then ultimately, uh, the kind of combination of policies, uh, whether it's isolationism, protectionism, nativism, this hyper populism mm -hmm. uh, that uh, finds partners only in those regimes uh, across uh, our continent, mm -hmm. uh, are basically at odds with Brussels. And uh, I think that uh, we, we don't need to necessarily name the names uh, to know uh, who I'm referring to here. This is uh, this is definitely not going to be only a busy time in the United States, but an, an important time for um, the future of the world as a whole. Thank you so much, ladies, for joining me tonight. Uh, we had Tanya Domi from the School of International and Public Affairs, Columbia University, and Gorana Grich, non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so, ladies and gentlemen, that would be all here on World Talks Context. I'm Claudia Czerwinska. Please stay tuned for more here on TVP World.